bank. Um... Yeah, I guess you're right. From Hollywood. Anyway, you sound very good tonight. We had a crowd last night that was, uh... well, the elevator didn't go to the top floor with the crowd last night. <laughs> They were, frankly, a little dense. They thought, for example, they thought the Iran Contra probe had something to do with Reagan's operation. <laughs> it's funny, you can never figure audience. There was just not a good crowd last night. Material was okay, but... <laughs> Last night, halfway through the monologue, guy took down the applause sign, tried to exchange it for a blender at Circuit City. <laughs> anyway, speaking to the president, last night I was watching the 11 o'clock news. I thought something was wrong with the color on the TV. Now, it turned out to be Colleen Williams. You know, she is a newscaster. She was blushing while she was describing Reagan's operation with a pointer and a map. <laughs> or you know, if we went in for something like that, it wouldn't make the paper. The presidents get no privacy. Now, as you know, the president has a clean bill of health. That's good news. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, come on. Unfortunately, I found out the president is covered by that medical plan you see advertised on cable TV. <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names. You know the one that promised you $50 a day? <laughs> Every day you're in the hospital, you get $50. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you get more hospital coverage from one of those open back hospital gowns. Have you ever seen one of those? <laughs> oh, you've been there. Uh, anyway. No, the president got expert medical attention. They airlifted in a thousand doctors that, that were stranded on a desert island with bare aspirin. <laughs> I don't know what the president's stay at the hospital cost, but they had to send over Oliver North's office safe. <laughs> anyway, the good, good news is the president is back at the, back at the White House and said he can't wait to resume his lame duckness. <laughs> now, <laughs> I mentioned Oliver North. You've been following this saga? This gets more bizarre every day. Now it was pointed out yesterday that 19 months before this hit the, uh, the Iran, uh, Iran, uh, Iran, what do we say, Iran, Iran or Iran? Iran, sounds better, right? All right? The arms scandal with Iran, 19 months before it hit the papers, apparently Oliver North had a safe at the National Security Council stuffed with a million dollars in cash. Now, North's excuse was a little bit lame. He claimed... The cash was personally awarded to him by Ed McMahon. <laughs> and when nobody bought that, he said he bought the safe at Al Capone's estate sale or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> we got a good show for you tonight. We have uh, one of the great singers. Well, I wish I had a voice like Robert Goulet. Robert Goulet. Is here. <laughs> and, and a few years ago, we discovered that in this country, they have every year the annual Cowboy Poets uh, meeting, I think, in Reno, Nevada. And we've had some of them on. We have Waddy Mitchell tonight and Baxter Black, who are two cowboy poets. It's fascinating stuff. They're with us, and a few other things. Let's see who you are. I thank you. Thank you very much. Hello there. I'm holding the album to my next guest. Good. Right. OK. Robert Goulet is a marvelous performer, and Bob's going to be in Horrors in Atlantic City on the 24th of this month, and at the Drury Lane Theater in Chicago for a week beginning the 27th of January. This latest album called Won't You Dance With This Man. Would you welcome Robert Goulet? <laughs> Midnight 
all alone in the moonlight. I can smile at the old days. It was beautiful then. In the lamplight, the withered leaves collected my feet. And the wind begins to moan. Memory alone in the moonlight. I can smile at the old days. It was beautiful then. Can I start this again? What do you say? Can I start this again? <laughs> 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 what do you think? Is that all right? First class line line. Midnight. Midnight. Wait, what? Oh, no, no, no. What, what is the first line? What? He forgot the first line. Keep yeah. it rolling. What? We gotta keep going. What? <laughs> Come Midnight. On back. I've got it now. <laughs> Yeah, here he is. Here he is. Here is right. New intro. Oh, God. New intro here. And here he is. We all set? It's a serious song. Yes, a serious song. Here we is. Here he is. We can open up. Midnight, not a sound from the pavement. Show is almost over. Show is over. <laughs> Why don't we do it as a commercial? That's right. Bob will learn the lyrics <laughs> and we'll come right back. Stay where you are. Right, Last week's winner is back with us again. Mr. Goulet is going to open with a very appropriate song, Memories. <laughs> As the moon lost her memory, she is smiling alone. In the lamplight, the withered leaves collected my feet. And the wind begins to moan. Memory all alone in the moonlight. I can smile at the old days. It was beautiful then. I remember the time I knew what happiness was. 
let the memory live again. Burned out ends of smoky days, the stale cold smell of morning. Street lamp dies, another night is over, another day. used to be handsome, used to be dashing, used to be brave, now he isn't so old, but somehow he's slipping, still he's got something. Someone could say, Would you dance with a man who used to be lucky? Life of the party, loaded with pride. Now he's stuck in a rut, lost in his daydream. Walking a treadmill, barely alive. Would you dance with a man who watches old movies, dreams about glory, longs for the sea? If you fancy a man, Used to be handsome, used to be ever so free. Then this is the time, if ever there was one, to look for the man who was me. If you touch me, you'll understand what happiness is. Let the memory live again. Let the beautiful you're singing better than ever we were making book over here when you started again that you're not going to get through it 
Because it's a funny thing, in the back of your mind... You're going to start to laugh. You're going to start to laugh. Edie Gourmet was on the show a few years ago, and I can still remember the song. The verse was, guess who I saw today, my darling. And she started that, and she got the giggles. And she must have started it five times and never got through the number. She'd get it two minutes into it and completely dissolve. Anyway, it was very pretty. (laughs) We'll be back. Stay with (laughs) you. Well, I said this has happened before. Now, the first time you sang the Star Spangled Banner on national television, if I remember, true? The you one, had uh, the what? A difficult song to sing, but you garbled the words or forgot the words. What happened? No. I... Well, what do you mean, no? <laughs> one word, one word. That's all. One word. You see, uh, uh, I lived in the United States till I was 13. My father died when I was 11. And I never really sang the banner then. Lived in Canada for 13 years, never sang the banner then. Mm -hmm. Now, right after Camelot, my manager uh, called me up. I wanted to see the fight in Lewiston, Maine, with Sonny Liston and at that time Cassius Clay. Lewiston, Maine is my mother's hometown. All Franco-Americans, and I'm Franco-American background. And he said, I got it, kid. I can get you two tickets for the fight and two rooms at the Poland Springs Hotel if you sing the anthem. And I said, no, no, I, I don't know the anthem. He says, hey, hey, you got to sing it sometime. Let the world know you know it. And I said, right. OK, because I wanted to see the fight. Now, you know, it's like, it's like you, you, when, you, when you tee off for the first time in a golf tournament with right. Lee Trevino there, you pray for two months to get off on the first tee. Mm-hmm. Well, I prayed, and I prayed. And I said, Lord, please, let me just let me get this thing right. It's a difficult song for a singer anyway, isn't it? Yeah, I, a... I, it's, not, it's not easy. I've done it since. Well, let me finish the story. Oh. <laughs> I walk into that town, French-Canadian, in my mother's hometown, hey, Robert, and I was, I was a big hero, and everybody loved me, and I had a wonderful time, had dinner with the governor that night of Maine, walked out on the porch, went, oh, say, can you see? Mother Don's early life, I had it down. And I got into that ring, 700 billion people watching this fight, and I went, oh, say, can you see? Brother Don's early night. One word, what? the fight lasted a minute and a half. They blamed it on me. <laughs> That's right, you did. But the dawn's early. And... Yeah, I, I walked out. That the, they hated me. When was I, the second time? You eighty had a shot second, at? eighty two. Uh, I was asked to sing for a, for an ABC fight of the week. <laughs> Another hundred million people watching. I said, No, 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 no. I'm not doing that again. Yeah. And my friend at that time is no longer my friend. <laughs> said, You've got to show the world you know the lyrics. And I said, Well, okay. So, so make good. No. I get in the ring. And I sang the song. I changed. Two words. <laughs> I mean, they were good words. Yes, but what did you change? They, I don't know. They rhymed and they made sense, but they weren't the right words. <laughs> when I went to get to my seat, because I wanted to see the fight, yeah. there was a lady sitting over here, and I had to go past her. She had her head bowed like this. And as I passed her, without raising her head, she said, you're improving. <laughs> <laughs> so you've retired that far. That's a song you should keep out of your repertoire. You know, yeah. don't, don't take another shot at it. I, I don't open with it anymore. <laughs> you, I, I heard you on the radio the other day coming in doing From Camelot on a clear day. No, that's, uh, that's from On a Clear Day. On a Clear Day, rather. <laughs> you, is, is there a certain song you get absolutely sick of singing? If ever I should leave you. If ever I should leave you. If I, mean, I would you leave you, get no, sick I, of doing it? I never get sick of doing that. No, that's, uh, that, that's uh, my signature song, and I, I love yeah. to sing it. I may sing it a little faster some nights when I want to get off, you know. <laughs> But you've never forgotten the lyrics of that. No, don't do that to me. <laughs> you know what's going to happen the next oh, time? The oh. next time, the rest of your life, when you start to go into memories, you're going to think of this night. Oh, I'm going to be in hysterics every yeah. time I, I try to sing that song. I may cut it from the act. <laughs> Put the Star Spangled Put Banner in drop it. We'll be right back. Stay where you are. OK, let me tell you a little bit about my next two guests. These two fellows you're going to meet are representatives of the annual gathering of the Cowboy Poets in Elko, Nevada, January the 29th through the 31st. And uh, you may not realize it, and I did until a few years ago, that poetry is part of the uh, cowboy tradition. And uh, every year, 50 or 60 of these poets gather together and put on a show. So tonight, representing are Waddy Mitchell and Baxter Black. Gentlemen. It's Wadi, right? Yeah. Good to see you again. How are you? Just real good, thanks. Is this the second or third time you've been third with us? Time? Third time. And Baxter, this is your first. Yes, sir. Your first out, time out of the shoot, huh? And I'm proud to be here. Yeah. 
So, uh, <laughs> does this thing get bigger every year? Seems to, yeah. yeah. We've gotten some nice press, and there's folks that are finding they like it and yeah. coming. I want to ask you fellows who do cowboying and uh, for a living, how you feel about Hollywood's depiction of, uh, of, of cowboys in motion pictures? Well, there, it's probably, I, I got a story about that if yeah. you want to hear that. Yeah, uh, well, okay. Uh, written by Gail Gardner. It says, I, I want to tell you a sad, sad story of how a cowboy fell from grace. Really, this is something awful. There never was so sad a case. One time I had myself a partner. I never knowed one half so good. We throwed our outfits in together and lived the way that cowboys should. He savvied all about wild cattle and was handy with a rope, and for gentle royal rain pony, just give me one he broke. He never owned the clothes but Levi's, and he wore them till they slick. Never wore no great big Stetson, because where we rode, the brush was thick. He never had no time for women, so bashful and shy was he, but then he knowed that they was poison, so he always let them be. <laughs> well, he went to work on distant ranges, and I hadn't seen him for a year, but then I had no cause to worry. I knowed someday he'd appear. Well, I just rode in from the mountains, feeling good and stepping light, for I just sold all my yearlings. Price was out of sight. But then, I seen the sight so awful, it caused my joy to fade away. It filled my very soul with sorrow. I never will forget that day. For down the street, there came a tripping, my old-time partner, as of yore, and though I know you won't believe me, let me tell you what he wore. <laughs> he had his boots outside his britches. They was made of leather green and red. His shirt was of a dozen colors loud enough to wake the dead. <laughs> Around his neck, he had a kerchief knotted through a silver ring. I swear to God, he had a wristwatch. You ever heard of such a thing? <laughs> Says I, old scout, what's your trouble? Looks like you've been eating loco weed. If you'd tell me how to help you, I'll get you anything you need. Well, he looked at me for half a minute, then began to bawl. He said, bear with me while I tell you what made me take this awful fall. It was a woman from Chicago. She put that engine sign on me. She said that I was handsome and romantic as can be. I'm afraid there's nothing you can do to save my head. I'm wrangling dudes instead of cattle. I'm what they call a first-class guide. I saddles up their pot-tailed ponies, fix their stirrups for them, too. I boost them up into the saddle. They give me tips when I'm through. Just like horses eating loco, I couldn't quit even if I tried. I reckon I'll wrangle dudes forever till the day that I shall die. Well, I drawed my gun and throwed it on him. I had to turn my face away, but I shot him squarely through the middle, and where he fell, I left him lay. <laughs> now, I hated for to do it, but what it's done, you can't recall. But when a cowboy turns dude wrangler, he ain't no good no more at all. <laughs> That's good, right? You see, Bob, how, why do you remember that whole poem? <laughs> no problem at all. Now, Baxter, I understand you started out as a, a veterinarian, is that correct? Yes, sir. And now you perform frequently. Well, I wound up being, doing this cowboy poetry for a living. Uh -huh. I go to big places like Buffalo, Wyoming. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm going to be in Sioux Center, Iowa, Saturday night. Sioux Center, Iowa, good, okay. Um, you want to give us a little, uh, yeah. little sample? Well, there's a uh, there's traditional cowboy poetry, and then there's a lunatic fringe, uh, which is kind of my area. Okay. <laughs> now, and I might wind up standing up. That's, that's okay, I'd sure. Just so, okay, uh, we'll follow you. This plastic? Yeah, well, you can move that out of the way if you want to. Now, cowboys, cowboys and vegetarians don't necessarily always see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in the cow business, so. Sure. And uh, so I found out the other day that they had done some studies, and it turns out that they found that plants feel pain. Pain. No, I didn't know that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so that inspired this little piece entitled The Vegetarian's Nightmare. OK. <laughs> Or a dissertation on plants' rights. Broccoli power! <laughs> Ladies and diners, I make you a shameful, degrading confession. A deed of disgrace in the name of good taste. Though I did it, I meant no aggression. I had planted a garden last April and lovingly sang it a ballad. But later in June, beneath the full moon, forgive me, I wanted a salad. 
so I, I slipped out and fondled a carrot, <laughs> caressing its feathery top. With the force of a brute, I tore out the root and it whimpered and came with a pop. <laughs> and laying my hand on a radish, I jerked <laughs> and it left a small crater. <laughs> then with the blade of my true value spade, <laughs> I exhumed a slumbering tater. <laughs> Celery I plucked, I twisted a squash. Tomatoes were wincing in fear. I choked the romaine and it screamed out in pain. Their anguish was filling my ears. I, I finally came to the lettuce as it cringed at the top of the row. <laughs> With one wicked slice, I beheaded it twice. As it writhed, I dealt a death blow. I butchered the onions and parsley till my hole was all covered with gore. I chopped and I whacked without looking back. Then I stealthily slipped in the door. <laughs> My bounty lay naked <laughs> and dying. So I drowned them to snuff out their life. <laughs> I sliced and I peeled as they thrashed and they reeled on the cutting board under my knife. <laughs> I violated tomatoes. So their innards could never survive. I grated and ground till they made not a sound, then I boiled the tater alive. <laughs> and then I took the small broken pieces I had tortured and killed with my hands and tossed them together, heedless of whether they suffered or made their demands. I ate them. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm sorry. But hear me, though I'm a beginner, those plants feel pain. So it's hard to explain to someone who eats them for dinner. I intend to begin a crusade for plants' rights, including chickpeas. <laughs> and the ACLU will be helping me, too. In the meantime, please pass the blue cheese. <laughs> That's marvelous. Does he not? No, no. Uh, 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 uh,